Greetings students and welcome to another video on quantum mechanics. In this lesson I'm going to analyze the solution we came up with for the infinite square well and solve a few important problems regarding the infinite square well. To begin let's set up our infinite square well problem first. Recall that in an infinite square well you have the boundaries at x equals 0 and x equals a. Your potential v outside the boundaries is infinitely large while the potential inside the boundaries is 0. The solution to this infinite square well problem where we solve the Schrodinger equation for this potential is what we derived in the previous video. And in that previous video which you can find by going to my quantum mechanics playlist and clicking the video on solving the infinite square well problem, I show that the solution to the Schrodinger equation for the infinite square well is given by the following, with the capital psi being this giant summation and the constant a sub n in front of each term in the summation given by this integral. Note that the small psi n conjugate is just this expression with the sign. Note also that the energy levels e sub n are given by the following expression, where m is the mass of the particle inside the square well whose wave function we're trying to determine by solving the Schrodinger equation. So we've got everything set up to apply this infinite square well solution and also illustrate some important quantum mechanics concepts. The first thing we'll do is find the expectation value of the position for the nth stationary state of our infinite square well solution. So what this means is finding the expectation value of x for psi sub n of x. This hopefully shouldn't be too cumbersome. You start by applying the formula for the expectation value of position for the wave function psi sub n. That's given by the following expression consisting of the integral over the entire spatial domain of psi sub n conjugate times x operating on psi sub n. Now x operating on psi sub n is the same as x times psi sub n, so I can simplify this equation to remove this operator symbol. In addition, I can change my limits of integration to zero and a because my wave function is zero outside the boundaries of the infinite square well so that part doesn't really matter. Now I'll substitute my psi sub n and psi sub n conjugate to get the following. Of course the conjugate here is the same as the original function because there are no imaginary terms, so ultimately we get an integral with 2 over a times x times sine squared as such. Just to simplify this rather cumbersome expression inside the sign, we'll use u substitution. We'll define our u to be n pi x over a, which means that du will be n pi over a dx, so dx is just a over n pi times du. With this u substitution, we must also change the limits of our integration, so when x is 0, u is 0, and when x is a, u is just n times pi. So finally, when we make the u substitution, of course rewriting x as a over n pi times u, we get the following. Combining and simplifying things gives us the following integral, and then we can use integration by parts to evaluate this integral. We'll go on the side, make u our first function, and sine squared our second function, and then integrate. And according to the integration by parts technique, this integral will become the first function times the integral of the second minus the integral of the integral of the second function times the derivative of the first. The big roadblock here though is finding the integral of sine squared, which we'll do here even further on the side. To find this integral, which I'll call i, we will once again use integration by parts. This time my first function will be sine u, and my second function will also be sine u. In that case, my sine squared integral becomes sine u times the integral of sine u, which is just negative cosine u, minus the integral of negative cosine u times the derivative of sine u, which is just cosine u. When you further simplify, this is what you get. Now I can use the Pythagorean identity of sines and cosines, which states that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, to write my cosine squared integral in terms of sine squared as follows. And then what I'll do next is move the sine squared part of this integral to the left, so that on the left hand side, I actually end up with 2 times the integral of sine squared u equals negative sine u cosine u plus the integral of 1, which is just u. And so finally, my integral of sine squared u is one half of u minus sine u times cosine u plus some integration constant, and I'll call this equation one. Next, I'll go back to my expectation value computations and plug equation one in there, of course, without the integration constant since we've got a definite integral. If we apply the limits on the first part of the right-hand side, we'll find that for u equals 0, the first part is 0 anyway, and for u equals n pi, the sine is now 0 because sine is 0 for integer multiples of pi. So ultimately, the first part just becomes half of n squared pi squared. We'll now turn our attention to the second expression consisting of the integral, and split up the terms individually. The integral of the u is just u squared over 2, and if I now apply the limits I get n squared pi squared over 2 minus 0 times 1 half, which simplifies to n squared pi squared times a quarter. 
Mean while the integral of sine u times cosine u is a bit more complicated, but made easier by using another substitution where I let v equal sine u. In that case, dv is just cosine u du, so I can simply write this integral as the integral of v dv, which is just v squared over two or sine squared over two. When I do this, my expression on the right becomes the following. Of course, when I apply the limits on the sine squared, I get zero for the n pi limit and zero for the zero limit, so the answer here is just zero. I'll then add the first two terms to get this as my answer. So finally, plugging this into the equation for the expectation value of x gives me a over two. So this is interesting. The expectation value of the position for the n stationary state does not depend on n. It does not depend on whether it's the ground state where n is one or whether it's an excited state. It's always a over two. Now the next thing we'll do is find the expectation value of x squared for the nth stationary state. Again, same logic and very similar formula. In fact, I've already skipped a step here and automatically written my x hat as x, and I've also automatically simplified my integration limits to zero and a. I'll substitute the psi sub n and its conjugate, which is the same as psi sub n as there are no imaginary components, and then I'll simplify to get the following. Once more, I'll make the same u substitution where I'll let u equal n pi x over a to simplify some of the algebra. And with this u substitution, just like last time, the limits of integration change to zero and n pi. Of course, I now have an x squared in the integral instead of x, so now with my u substitution, my integral becomes the following. I'll simplify the coefficient and take it outside to get the following. And next I'm gonna use integration by parts again on the integral with my first function as u squared and my second function as sine squared. I'll get u squared times the integral of sine squared, which as we found before was just one half of u minus sine u times cosine u. Then I'll subtract the integral of the integral of sine squared, again the same thing, times the derivative of u squared, which is just two u. When we apply the limits to the first term in the braces, the term becomes zero when u is zero. In addition, the sine term becomes zero for n pi, just because sine is zero for any integer multiple of pi. As a result, when we apply the limits, we get n cubed pi cubed over two. We can also simplify the second term by canceling the twos and distributing the u to get this expression. I'll now split up the terms in the integral and perform the integration of u squared, which is just u cubed over three. I'll also go to the side and integrate this u times sine u cosine u term. And how do we integrate this expression? You guessed it, integration by parts. I'll make u my first function and sine u cosine u my second function. So I'll get u times the integral of sine u cosine u minus the integral of the integral of sine u cosine u times the derivative of u, which is just one with respect to u. Now the integral of sine u cosine u I've already found from before, it's just sine squared u over two, which I'll plug in here. If I apply the limits now to this first term, I'll just get zero because sine is gonna be zero at zero and at n pi as well, so it'll just be zero. Meanwhile, the integral in the second term on the right is just negative half of the integral of sine squared. And we know that the integral of sine squared is half of u minus sine u cosine u, just like before. So if we now apply the limits, we'll just get negative n pi over four because the sine term will be zero at both limits. If we now plug this into our expectation value equation, we'll get the following. We'll apply the limits on the middle term then to get this. And finally, we'll combine everything and simplify to end up with this expression for the expectation value of the position squared. Now this expression, unlike the previous one, actually depends on the value of n corresponding to the stationary state. The next thing we'll do is find the expectation value for the x momentum for the nth stationary state. Again, same logic and similar formula, except now we're using the momentum operator. Note that again, I've automatically simplified my integration limits to zero and a. And recall from a previous video that the momentum operator is just h bar over i times the partial with respect to x of whatever it's operating on. So when I substitute the psi sub n and its conjugate, which again is the same as psi sub n because of the lack of imaginary components, and then if we apply the momentum operator to the psi on the right end of the integral, I'll get the following. Note here that I've taken the derivative of the psi, which is the sine term, and gotten cosine from it because the derivative of sine is cosine. And of course, the coefficient of x comes out because of the chain rule. 
We'll combine some of the coefficients to get the following for our momentum expectation value. And once more, I'll make the same u substitution where I'll let u equal n pi x over a to simplify some of the notation. Again, our limits become the same 0 and n pi that they were before. And so putting everything in our integral in terms of u yields the following. I've already substituted the dx in terms of du and simplified the coefficient out front here. Now we've done this integral previously and I've shown that the answer is sine squared u over 2. Now my sine is going to be 0 at both the limits because sine 0 is 0 and the sine of an integer multiple of pi is also 0. So ultimately when I apply the limits the expectation value of my momentum will be 0. Of course this makes sense we're talking about a stationary state and since it is a stationary state it will not have any momentum because it's stationary. The last expectation value we'll calculate is the expectation value of the momentum squared operator. Again, same logic and method as before. I've automatically simplified my integration limits to 0 and a, and the momentum operator squared I've written as the momentum operator applied twice. So we get h bar squared over i squared times the partial derivative of the partial derivative, which is the same as the second partial derivative. So when I substitute the psi n's and psi n conjugates, I simplify the i squared to negative 1 using the definition of the imaginary number, we get the following. Next I'll take the second derivative of the sine term. The first derivative of sine is cosine, so the second derivative is just negative sine. Of course the coefficient of x comes out twice by the chain rule. We'll combine some of the coefficients to get the following for our momentum squared expectation value. And once more, I'll make the same u substitution to simplify some of the notation. Again, our limits become the same 0 and n pi that they were before, and so putting everything in our integral in terms of u yields the following. I've already substituted the dx in terms of du and simplified the coefficient out front. This is just rinse and repeat from before. And we've already done this integral multiple times during this video. You probably have the answer memorized by now. It's just the following. If I apply the limits, I end up with this expression for the momentum squared expectation value, n pi h bar over a whole squared. The last few things I'll do in this video involve determining the uncertainty on x on the momentum p sub x and then verifying the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The uncertainty on x is just the square root of the difference between the expectation value of x squared and the squared expectation value. So if I substitute in these expectation values, this is what I'll get. I can simplify this expression to yield the following, where I've taken out the a from the square root. Similarly, the uncertainty in momentum is given by this expression. And if I make the relevant substitutions, this is what I end up with to get this as the uncertainty on my momentum. And now we'll verify the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which states that the product of the uncertainties on x and momentum should be at least h bar over 2. If I take the product of the uncertainties for my infinite square while stationary states, this is what I'll end up with. And I'll simplify this expression to get the following in terms of h bar. So the smallest possible uncertainty product I can get is with the ground state, n equals 1. And if I substitute n equals 1, I get the product of the uncertainties of x and p sub x at least equal to 0.568h bar, which I get when I plug the values in on the calculator. And this is still greater than h bar over 2, which was specified as the minimum limit in the uncertainty principle. So even with the lowest possible uncertainty I can get from one of the stationary states, which in this case happens to be the ground state, even with that lowest possible value of uncertainty, that value of the product of the uncertainties is still greater than h bar over 2, which is supposed to be the lower limit according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So therefore, I have once again verified the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for position and momentum. So anyway, that should do it for this rather algebraically cumbersome video, but hopefully it should solidify some of what we've discussed in quantum mechanics as it applies to the infinite square well solution. I'd like to thank the following patrons, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan signing out.